So I started the research way back when I was at the University of Oxford, uh, about 2001 or 2, um, with a PhD student, Beth Shapiro. And we were looking to use uh, bison bones from caves across Europe to try and study the impacts of climate change back through time, because there was an awful lot of bison, uh, a lot of bones, and we figured they would be potentially a good marker of the environmental changes that are taking place in the past. We basically receive the bones, or we collect the bones uh, with collaborators on the ground, different places, and when we receive the bone, we can actually analyze them, so grind them completely and extract the DNA out of them in our uh, laboratory, which is dedicated for ancient DNA research. And once we've extracted the DNA, we can actually sequence part of it. And what we've done for that study is first sequencing a small portion of the mitochondrial DNA, which is only inherited maternally, it's the maternal side. And then we move to the full mitochondrial genome. And once we actually were capable technologically to sequence more, we were capable of targeting, so fishing out important bits of the DNA from the full nuclear genome to actually uh, analyze that part as well. So we managed to analyze. And that, that, yeah, and that's important because the, the female line, the mitochondria, which is what we normally use, is only giving us a small part of the history of an animal. And in this case, as it turned out, it was a hybrid, in which case, of course, the male and the female lines are telling you quite different stories. So the mitochondria, which we'd had for a decade by that stage, and was telling us this is something new, but we couldn't work out what it was, was only a part of the story. And until we could get that nuclear portion to actually solve the, the mystery of where they came from as a hybrid, we were um, banging our heads on a wall, really. We knew something was off, but we couldn't prove or decide what it was. Basically, you look at the tree we get from the mitochondrial DNA, and what we get is a wrong answer. Mm. So on the tree, you can see that all European bison, including the one that we've discovered from the past, and this past diversity, which is now extinct, they all look close, close, closely related to cow and closer <laughs> to cow than it does to bison. When they are truly bison, you look at them, they behave like bison, they look like bison. Well, they didn't behave but, like bison because they did. Well, not these ones, but the no. modern one. Right, right. <laughs> the, modern, the modern European bison, which has DNA related to the thing that we saw in the past, is definitely bison. It looks just like a bison, it's not a cow. And yet, um, the, the mitochondrial DNA you get out of the modern European bison, these things in the past, was definitely close to a cow, and you're like, uh, something's clearly going Doesn't a little bit fishy in the family history of, of European um, bovids. Um, That's also yeah. one reason it took us so long actually to get the story right, because mm. we had this information about this new clade in the past, which is unknown now. It's the first time we could see this past diversity of this bison, this mystery clade of bison, uh, but we couldn't make sense out of it it didn't make sense to us that it was at that particular time, at that particular place, with this particular type of uh, DNA. And it's not until we actually could get more of the story, more samples, and the nuclear side of it, that we could make sense out of it. What we found was that the, the DNA of this strange new uh, species that we're calling bison X, um, because it was so new, or, or, or in the latter stages, the Higgs bison, because that was a funny joke. Um, we noticed was present in all the caves at certain periods of time, big blocks of time, like before 50,000 years ago, everything is bison X. And between um, about 29,000 years ago and right up until uh, most of the ice age, the, the peak of the glacial max, it's all bison X. In between, it's the step bison. So the, the two different bison are taking turns to dominate big chunks of Europe. And so, because it was like either one thing or the other thing, in terms of the mitochondrial DNA, it looked very clear it was a new species, right? It's the, they, they were, they were, um, the changes were matching the climate shifts that were going on. So the whole environment changed according to climate, and then suddenly one species was present or, or the other. Our new one turns up and it was really cold, like, like tundra, tundra conditions with, with, um, without warm summers. And the step bison is presumably there when it's covered in grass because that's what it does. So that really misled us for a long time because it looked like two different forms doing two different things. It all very um, proper as separate species. And it wasn't until we got the nuclear DNA out that we suddenly figured out, okay, yeah, new species, but actual hybrid origins. It's not something that's come completely out of the blue from the bison side of things. It's actually an aurox and a bison doing things they're not meant to be doing together and producing a completely new species. 
uh, that survived, which is bizarre because normally that's not meant to happen in mammals. Like usually the parent species are the one that actually take over mm. after the hybridization happen because the offspring don't have the same you know efficiency in terms of um, fertility and other mm. traits. But in that particular case, it turns out that the successful hybridization and a successful um, further map mating meant that these hybrids might have been well adapted to actually these climate changes that happened in Europe at the time. Yeah. Uh, so, so normally when you get hybridization going on between mammals, the, the hybrid form isn't optimized for the environment. You know, it's kind of half of one, half of the other parent. And so it gets subsumed back into one of them. That's what standardly happens. So you see mixing going on, but they never forms a new species. Here it did. And somehow this new species carved out a niche for itself on the environment. And, uh, and ironically, it was the largest European mammal to actually survive the extinctions at the end of the Ice Ages. So not only did it survive, it survived very well um, compared to a lot of other things. You know, lions, mammoths, everything that die out. That bison got through. Uh, got through the Ice Ages, all right. Didn't get through the Communist Revolution quite so well. Um, so in fact, it almost went extinct in the 1920s um, because the game parks that had been preserved under Tsarist rule for hunting for the Tsar and his family uh, were all abandoned. And all the locals, of course, went in and um, killed a lot of these animals for food. And so the, the whole species got down to 12 individuals who actually survived in the, the forest on the border between Poland and Belarus. And that was what fooled us as well, because when you reduce a population to 12 individuals, you get massive um, genetic drift. This is what we call it when, when you, you suddenly reduce your diversity of, of all the genetics right down to a very small um, group. And it's such a small subset of what was there previously. And all descendants that come from that bottleneck have that same DNA type. And as a result, when we found the ancient version back in the past on the bones, it didn't look anything like the modern survivors. But it is ancestral. That, that hybrid went on to become the modern European bison. But the DNA looked quite different. And that was because of that recent trip. So when you look at the modern bisons now, the European bison in the forest of Poland, for example, that's the one that turns up in the vodka, which is yes. the most important thing probably the about this entire vodka. project, yes. is that that bison pees on grass, which turns up, I'm sure it pees on grass. The, the grass that the bison eats turns up in the beautiful um, vodka whose name is... Zubrovka. Zubrovka, yeah. um, which we drink fairly regularly. So that, that is a very important thing uh, about this project. So basically when you look at the modern uh, specimen in the, in the forest there and you, you type its DNA, uh, the mitochondria would look like a cow, actually, mm. uh, as it did for the ancestors and after the hybridization. But it's only when we actually get, got our hands on ancient samples prior to this big bottleneck because mm. of the hunting and further back in time that we could actually decipher what actually happens uh, for the origin of the European bison and put um, an age and an idea of what, uh, where and how this hybridization happened between aurochs and steppe. And what we found out that when you look at modern bovids, what you can see is that most of the time a bull, for example, for cows, would mate with a female and uh, subsequently to what might happen in that case is that uh, male step bison, so the ancestor of the American bison on the American side, actually could have mated with a female aurochs and that ended up with an offspring with 50% aurochs, 50% bison on its nuclear genome, the host genome, but the maternal mitochondria is actually fully aurochs. And then this male bull or some other bulls of the step bison might have mated again with this offspring and reduced the amount of aurochs genetics mm. in the pool but still maintain this mitochondrial lineage. And you end up with exactly the genetical um, uh, imprints that we observe now into uh, all the bison we've studied, including this uh, odd X species. Mm. It looks to be about 90% step bison, 10% aurochs um, genes, roughly speaking. So clearly there was a lot more breeding um, through time at the beginning with this new species, with the step bison population. Before, it became genetically isolated, which it seems to have done uh, roughly from 120,000 years onwards, um, or not long thereafter. 
what we can tell with the genetics, when we look into the nuclear genome or the, the bits and pieces we could actually recover from this ancient sample about their nuclear genome, is that we can tell that up to 10% comes from ORAC's origin. And the 10% that we see between the different individuals suggests that it might have happened with a single hybridization origin. So between the different clades of European bison we studied, the bits that are from the Orox are actually similar. So we cannot prove that it didn't happen several times in the past, but it looks to be a single hybridization origin that gave rise to this new species. Part of the project, um, the idea was, the general accepted idea, was that the European bison, which is a, a, a threatened population that um, survives in the forests of the lowland Europe, mainly on the border between Poland and, and Belarus, that had a fossil record that went back 10,000 years. And prior to that, uh, it didn't have a fossil record. So it mysteriously had been created at that point. Everything older than 10,000 years as a bison fossil in Europe was the steppe bison. This is the Ice Age bison that ran across the grasslands of Central Asia, right over to Alaska and down into, into Mexico and in North America. Uh, and that, that was the standard pattern. Um, and we just thought we could, we could measure the bones from um, these populations back through time to try and look at the, the impacts of climate change, to see um, how that had affected the population structure and, and the movements of these groups. That's really all we were trying to do when, when we started. Uh, the project principally to, to measure step by step. With uh, the, this research uh, topics uh, is that looking through all the bones we received to study this uh, megafaunal extinction in Europe, um, we actually managed to get DNA from a lot of bison specimen which turned out not to belong to any known genetic diversity we had studied before and it formed actually a new clade in the phylogenetic tree of bovids. What we ended up um, uh, understanding is that this new clade did not make sense with the species, the, the evolution of the species itself. And it turned out that this particular lineage was something that went extinct, so this lineage went extinct in the, in the past, but has a maternal lineage which is much closer to cow than it is to bison. And this is the case for the modern European bison uh, that is still you know, uh, in, the, in, the, in the forests in Europe, in Poland for example. And so this new bison that we discovered in the past in Europe is probably really closely related to the modern European bison. And it's not as only it, when as we... It as it turned out. We as it turned out, we didn't, we know, didn't that. know that for a good decade. And it's only when we managed to get the nuclear DNA out of these guys and we captured the nuclear DNA that we could make sense out of that story and actually tell that they all came from a hybridization event between an aurochs, which is the ancestral form of cow, and the steppe bison, which was uh, the, the main bison of, uh, of interest in that study uh, when we started that. The, the Ice Age form of bison that, um, that ranged across Russia and into the New World, the, the, the dominant thing you think of when you're looking at pictures of the Ice Age out, out and in the steppe. finally gave uh, uh, rise to the mm. American bison on the American yeah. side when they crossed the Beringia. We'd spent ages, almost a decade, with a strange genetic result saying that you've got a new form of bison running around in Europe that none of the fossil people have identified. And we could tell from the carbon dates that it had certain climactic uh, conditions that it likely to turn up in. So we, we're spending a lot of time thinking of what did this thing look like? What, um, what, how was it a new species? It was a hybrid form that created a new species in the landscape. But we knew nothing about how it might behave or what it might look like. We didn't have a skull for it. We still haven't found a skull for this species. So we didn't know what its teeth were like, like what it was eating. And we were, were really scratching our heads about this when um, someone suggested, well, why don't you look at some of the cave art? Um, and what instantly was attractive about that, we hadn't thought of it previously, was that the the caves, uh, when, when this art is being drawn, are recording exactly the periods of time when we're seeing the switch of dominance from the steppe bison to our, our new species. Um, so that's when Julian contacted some of the, the French cave researchers. So we had the chance to, uh, to um, 
get in, in contact with the world specialists about, about cave painting, which are Egypto Cello and Carlo Fritz in France. And basically, when we call them, we uh, explain the kind of results we observed with this uh, new uh, hybrid bison uh, at the place of the cave painting, at the time of the cave painting, and the, and the place in Europe. And we, when we exposed our results, their reaction was, oh, finally, we can actually make sense out of what we've been saying to our colleagues for years now, which is the cavemen could not have painted this bison with only one model. And when Jill was actually looking at all the caves and all the bison, he was, he's, he's the one who's redrawn some of the, of the, of the paintings for some of the re reproduction, for example, for the Chauvet cave. So he really knows intimately what the uh, morphological description looked like in the cave painting. And he's been telling his colleagues that I can distinguish two different groups of paintings regarding the morphology, the main morphology of the mm -hmm. bison. Mm -hmm. And it's quite intriguing because the cave artists were really precise. In for fact, that's one of them there, isn't it? Yeah. That's one. And that's, and then that's one of the step bison in the Chauvet cave. Yeah, so that one looks more like a step bison with, <coughs> with the, um, the V shape on it. And you can see that for some of this painting, the details are quite remarkable. So they were actually drawing details which are now uh, been uh, proved to be very, very accurate. For example, with some of the modern species still alive and the, the horse and everything. So we can tell that they're not messing around. There is, of mm. course, some artistry, artistry and everything, but basically they can redraw really well the morphology. So Gilles was going through that and basically could pull apart two different, very distinct group of bison uh, drawings, which had different type of morphology. And when we looked at our results and actually matched the time of the drawings, the place of the drawings and the time of our genetic results and the samples we've actually identi and identified genetically, it turns out that in the cave painting, the cavemen were drawing, they depicted the transition between one of these change of population from the step bison and this new form of hybrid bison. And that's quite remarkable that the cavemen actually were storytelling the, 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 what, what actually happened and they're telling us what the biology was at the time without realizing for a few thousand years in a row and we just had to look at it. The way the cave artists uh, portraying these animals might not have been 100% you know, accurate. Although, when you look at it, you, you know, these guys are better artists than pretty much anyone I know, certainly way better than I could ever be. Uh, and the detail that they record about the movement and the actions of these animals um, are remarkably uh, lifelike. You know, given that you're doing it underground without electric lighting with presumably a burnt stick or some sort of very primitive tool, I mean, this is remarkable art. And we know that they're, they're very accurate because, of course, their entire lives depended upon the ability to identify the types of animals, their behavior, their psychology. I mean, hunting and knowing how to uh, exist around these animals depended on whether your, your, your family and your group survived or not. And so the irony is after um, doing all the genetic research is that the, the artists themselves had actually drawn quite accurately, we think, the two different forms of bison and had been showing us all along, showing everyone all along. It's just that no one was recognizing that that's in fact what was shown on the cable. So it was, it was in plain sight, uh, right yeah, the way this, through. This uh, study truly is this uh, interdisciplinary approach that we managed to do at the end with the different teams. Some of them were, you know, cave painting specialists, paleontologists, and uh, uh, DNA geneticists. And it was, I think it's one of the reasons that study came so long actually to take in shape so that we could get a full picture to mm. get out because a while ago we couldn't make sense out of of our results and it's only in the light of more results, more data, uh, digging a bit deeper into the data and what it meant and also approaching these people that we could finally make sense of it, of it all. So um, it's quite remarkable that we could put together so many people with different well, I mean, approaches. We, we almost published three times I think, over yeah. 15 years working on this project we, we almost published three times and each time we would have had the wrong answer. But we thought we were close. It, it wouldn't have been wrong, but it wouldn't have been the full story it and misled it. Definitely, definitely misleading. So we're glad we could actually approach the, the, the French team that brought this uh, cave painting angle that matched the, the rest of the story. 
The bigger picture of the research, I guess, is that we've actually got a hybridization event, which is not really meant to happen anyway, between different species, forming a completely new species on the landscape. And, and while we know that happens in, in plants and various other things, and, in, and we know that hybridization happens in mammals, for example, uh, brown bears and polar bears, uh, we can even see it in mammoths. Whenever it uh, occurs, generally the hybrid is just um, subsumed by one of the parent species again because it's not optimized for the landscape. It's half of one parent and half of the other. So it's very rare to find a hybridization event actually creating a completely new species that goes on um, and survives. And so it's telling us really that uh, we need to look at how climate and environmental changes actually can cause species diversity through this quite new means, which, which is hybridization. It's quite remarkable to think about it when you establish that probably it's been recorded in the cave painting all that time, and we have all these fossil records going through millions of years with quite detailed fossil records about the bison itself in Europe, and we couldn't figure that one out. So it's been hiding there in plain sight, basically, and it's only thanks to uh, not only DNA, but getting DNA from ancient samples prior to the latest bottleneck and prior to these particular events that we could actually characterize this hybridization. So that study is only possible because we bring together cave art specialists, cave art specialists uh, paleontologists, the morphology and the DNA. But it's truly being capable now to technologically to get DNA from ancient samples that allows us to uh, answer these, uh, these big questions now. And the other, you know, the other angle about all this is that um, despite this quite exceptional fossil record of the bison in Europe, probably one of the best ones around, and the cave artists who were showing us what was going on at the walls, we still couldn't get it right. So that begs the question of how many other uh, groups where we have these kind of records are we, are we missing stuff as well? More studies to come.